is named Phoenix Perry, and she is uh, a creative artist and an entrepreneur and an advocate. Uh, she's actually the founder of the Code Liberation Found Foundation, and uh, it's a program that it's a free program that teaches women to code games, and it's been hugely successful, already reaching thousands of women. Uh, she speaks all over the world about her projects, and we're very lucky to have her today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Phoenix Perry. So anyway, hello, I am Phoenix Perry. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Phoenix Perry. Um, I teach computing at Goldsmiths University of London and physical computing. Um, I have a master's from NYU School of Engineering and I do a lot of engineering stuff on top of being um, a highly creative artist. I also own a game studio called Dozen Eyes Games and we make uh, museum installations and applied games. And I like to make physical hardware games with my friend Adele Lin and this is this crazy uh, synthesizer we built that was actually a geodesic dome. And sometimes we do things like this that are like light based synthesizers and take them to parties. Um, and I also run, as he mentioned, Collaboration Foundation, which is an organization that uses creative technologies as a gateway to teach women about computer science. We've done a lot of really fun things. Um, I ran a one button workshop at NYC Resistor that taught both hardware and software for how to make video games. Uh, we've done a series of high school classes, lady jams, we've worked with Black Girls Code to reach out into a much larger community than our own, um, and we run a ton of game development classes for large audiences in New York City and around the United States. And we're starting May 4th is our first class in London. If anyone wants to recommend any woman to come, it'll be at Goldsmiths from 6.30 to 8.30 in the Ben Pimlot building. I'm very excited about that. Um, so I'm going to kick off my talk today and talk about there was a soul with a great dream. And I'm going to start my talk today by talking about Nikola Tesla. And I want to talk about this man because I believe he had the vision for how technology should actually be integrated into our culture. And that is free and accessible and for the benefit of all humanity. And there was always one group with a lot of greed as soon as there was one soul with a vision. Right? We have this guy who wanted to put a power meter on Tesla's energy and charge for it. And they were very successful in this endeavor. And this is, I think, the call crux of where we're at today and the kind of battle that we spend um, our kind of fight looking at. Um, so there's a fundamental drive to improve life versus this fundamental drive to profit from life in technology. And technology should be seen as a limitless resource. Today, these same forces are working um, at each other, and one is exceptionally good at co-opting, corrupting, and shutting the other one down. But there's never, ever stopped being a resistance. So this is uh, the Chaos Computing Club, which some of you probably know. I consider it the greatest hacker club in, in, in Europe, and I'm very, very inspired by these guys and making technology accessible for the masses is at the root of their mission. And if you're alive right now and a resistance rebel like myself, uh, the state of technology education should really concern and interest you. Why? Because we're looking at the separation of the maker and the technician. And there's this grand promise right now in the air that we're all makers, that somehow it's okay. And this is what white first world male making looks like, right? It's sponsored by DARPA. It's existing in these very corporate and very highly accessible governmental structures. And, you know, this kid is making, you know, it's a potato gun, but it's a weapon still. And, like, here it is. And that's what gets put in the White House as the, like, pinnacle of making. Meanwhile, we have minimum wage or less women of color technicians building the technologies that are actually funding and fueling this movement. Humans make things. That's the kind of promise here, right? But I saw a really great talk from uh, Lee Bukala in 2014 at IO. That really, it, it hit such a chord with me. And she looked at the cover. She did a longitudinal study on Make Magazine. And she looked at all the cover, covers. And in nine years, 39 covers, 41 people, 
80% male, 15% women and girls, zero people of color. What does that say for what make is? And in her 2012 study, the median income of the average person in the maker community was over $100,000. That's a pretty high barrier. And in this process, we've sort of forgotten the history of hacking that has been pro prolific and profound and deeply rooted in our culture and has often encouraged women and people of color to become very actively involved in hacking and reverse engineering all kinds of things from the creation of music technology to the creation of turntablism to doing God knows what amazing awesomeness with your cars. And we've criminalized it to the point where in the last like year we had a kid make a clock and because he wasn't white they just like lost their minds, right? So hacking is political. The fact that that kid got like kicked out of school should be a really stern reminder to everyone in this room that what we do is a political action and it can be seen as such. So I want to talk about what I see as the false economic barrier and the rise of obfuscation under the guise of access. So this is a very specific breakout board that I had run across this year when I was teaching. And I had uh, originally given my students the ICs and some of them went to look up the data sheets and they found this and they were like, oh no, do we need this SparkFun piece? They were very, very confused and they thought they needed to buy this SparkFun board. This is just a 74HC595 shift register. There's nothing fancy about it. They just put it on a PCB board. And in fact, they kind of rerouted the pins so it's actually less clear where they're at on the actual IC. They're charging $2.95 for this. Okay. By the time you get that imported into England, that's two pounds 42. Okay. However, if we order this from China with free shipping, you can get 20 of them <laughs> for one pound five. That's six P each. There's no additional engineering on this PCB board. So I want to stop and talk about the economic cost of this. What is the economic cost, the environmental cost of taking a chip, shipping it from China, shipping it to the US, producing a PCB B board, putting the chip on the PCB board, selling it back to England and then shipping it to someone in England? That's just absurd. So what's the real economic barrier we have going on here? So employment in computer systems and design industries. So this was a nice statistic I found that just showed the rise of design and computing jobs in the United States. I'm sure in other countries this graph is very similar. Technological jobs are on the rise. However, the percentage of these jobs held by women is on the decline. And this is what education looks like, right? This terrifying ramp of up. And this is the actual economic barrier. The actual economic barrier here is the $90,000 price tag at schools like NYU a year to get an undergraduate degree. I don't know who can graduate with that kind of debt and do anything but be a slave. So meanwhile, we've seen the rise of alternative STEM education, which is what can counter that, right? If we have any hope at all, it's that the people in this room teach what they know for free. Everyone wants open structures. We all want that, right? It's something we're all direly looking for. However, and, and you know, we all want to include diversity. No one in this room is, I don't want women and people of color in my office. In fact, I think many of you want exactly the opposite. However, we're tripping up and we're not changing our surrounding culture. And that's the problem. So no matter how much we want to include diversity, until we address the cultural systemic problems here and do things like really question, like do, does that need to go on a PCB board? Do we really need to make this harder? Um, we're going to be in trouble. So here are some things that I thought I would just ask you guys to help me change over the coming years. So one, we need to really deal with the participation of women and people of color in forums. So if you run a forum or you moderate a forum, be very aware that it is a, a, possibly a very hostile place for a woman to make a post. Um, we must position our image. So be aware also if you're making a flyer or you're putting a header on your website, is that person a woman or a person of color? Because that makes a big difference. Harassment. If you see harassment happening in your forums or on your sites, 
please do something about it. If you see it happening in your hacker spaces, immediately address it. Adopt a con like a code of conduct. I can't encourage you enough. There are open source ones that you can check out on the internet. Bullying is also really problematic. We need to redesign work in a way that can include women and people of color. Often they come from backgrounds that don't look like traditional engineering backgrounds. And you should go, hey, maybe I need to create an opportunity here and give someone a chance to learn on the job or share some of my skills because often that employee is probably going to be way better and way more loyal than if you had just hired somebody who looked like they were qualified on paper. Um, who we hire, right? That, that goes back to that issue. So we have a lack of investment in women and people of color for this kind of thing. Like HR companies, they say, we want this giant list of crap. And then like a woman has, you know, two or three of those qualifications and won't apply. Or worse, she'll actually have statistically 80% and won't apply. But if a guy has like, I think it's something insane, like 5% he'll apply. So we need to look at how that happens. Um, we also need to quit your bitching. Like honestly, when someone clones your $40 PCB board for five bucks, chances are you deserved it. Go make something else and share it with the community because you have the privilege to do it easily. And then the other thing I'm gonna encourage everyone in here to do is look past standard qualifications when judging or assessing if someone is of merit. So I'm gonna ask that you question, is this deeply accessible? Is this new, is putting this piece of component on a PC board that I got from China and selling it back, making it more or less accessible for people to use and understand this technology? Why are, so why should you care? Why should anyone in this room worry about this? Okay, so this is kind of my big idea here. Think about technology like a gene pool, right? And if you think of every technological solution as kind of contributing to the health of our technological environment, what's gonna happen if it's all just one type of person from one type of power structure making all the tech, right? you're gonna end up with a less optimal solution. Without a healthy diversity in the tech gene pool, we'll produce solutions that are less optimal and problematic, most likely. Technology is too powerful of a human reality to ex exclude women, queer people, and people of color. And when you produce something, please stop and think about the total cost. Not just the cost of like producing it that day or at that moment. So, this is something that when I saw that Hackaday sent people to space, it made me very happy because we don't really have forever and the stakes here are getting us off this rock, right? And technology is the only way we are gonna do that. You are responsible for inclusion and diversity in technology and culture. Not the government, not a magazine, and not a movement. Yes, you. Go make tech Tesla proud. <laughs>